Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you all had an enjoyable lunch. We will now be moving on to our third panel, a discussion on modern Jerusalem. Thanks, Joshua. Good afternoon. Um, okay, so I am moderating this session this afternoon. I've had a quick chat with Menachem and Noor. And what we've decided to do is that we will have the two presentations run one after the other. Uh, Menachem will speak for about 25 to 30 minutes, and then Noor will speak for about 25 to 30 minutes. That will take us to about half past three, and then we've got half an hour for questions. So I'll ask you all to hold your questions to, the, to that last half hour. We'll get through the presentations first. Um, I will kick off each of the presentations by introducing our speakers and talk a little bit about what they want to talk about before we move on. Okay, so if everyone is ready, let's get started. Um, let me first welcome Professor Menachem Klein, who's from the Department of Political Science at the Bailan University in Israel. Uh, okay, Mike's and I are not friends. Um, he's a faculty member at the Department of Political Science, and he has been a fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford University, at MIT, the European University, Leiden University, and King's College, London. In 2000, Professor Klein was an advisor for Jerusalem Affairs and Israel PLO Final Status Talks. To, he was the advisor to Prime Minister Ehud Barak. His book, Lives in Common, Arabs and Jews in Jerusalem, Jaffa and Hebron, which was printed by the Oxford University Press and Seahurst London, was named one of the best 2014 non-fiction books by the New Republic and was published also in German and Hebrew. So we are very pleased to welcome him here. Today he is going to talk about social changes in Jerusalem from 1949 to 1967, looking at the demographic and geographical changes and um, also looking at the city's development policies that have been implemented. Um, he talks therefore not only about urban realities but also how these have been integrated into the national policies of the two states who have actually overseen Jerusalem in this period up to the 1967 war. So, Professor Klein. Thank you very much. No. Yeah, it's okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you, Victor, for inviting me, and Jamalia for the excellent uh, organization. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I moved, you know, uh, I published a lot about uh, political history, uh, urban history, post-67 and so on. And a few years ago, I decided to go back to uh, cultural and social history since the uh, late 19th century. And Lives in Common was the, was the product. And uh, recently, I decided to uh, start a new project of uh, studying Jer divided Jerusalem, but not uh, from the political institutional aspect, but from the social and everyday life. And uh, so uh, I, I, just, I just started. Well, I, um, what I would like to present today is some data, uh, socio-demographic, socio-economic data uh, on uh, both Jordanian and Israeli Jerusalem between 49 and uh, 67, uh, which speaks a lot. We, we can learn much uh, about it. But my uh, research will not end with this data. I hate writing boring books and uh, dry, just bring uh, dry data. Um, so I started also interviewing uh, Palestinians on their everyday life as uh, teenagers in uh, Jordanian Jerusalem. Um, I, I will go also to, to, to uh, excavate uh, Israeli archives, municipal archives, the British archives, and so on. But to start with, I think that the, uh, the data that I found in Israeli uh, archives and, and, and books are very, very telling. Uh, the, so the main source of the data that I, I present, so the conclusions, not, not just data, the conclusions that I uh, present here today uh, is based on Jordanian primary sources, Jordanian archives that the Israelis occupied or still possessed uh, since uh, 67. Um, 
and uh, they are available. Beside, I also uh, rely on Israeli state archive data um, collected in the first year of the Israeli occupation between 67 and uh, 68. Israelis uh, made a census and uh, collected much data on uh, the um, uh, just annexed uh, city in order to know how to run it. So uh, uh, the, uh, the, the data that I have, I think it, it is very, very reliable. The Jordanian papers uh, include also the private paper papers of the mayor and the Mohafez, the governor of Jerusalem uh, district. And they are available. That's uh, uh, in the uh, Israeli state archive and the Israeli municipal archives, including also, of course, uh, minutes of the city council. It's not a completed uh, collection of, of minutes, but uh, it, what, what they have there uh, is, is very telling. Now, first of all, let's look, uh, let's have an overall view of the two cities. And uh, uh, I would say, uh, okay, uh, two cities, the, the, okay, yeah, it's not one Jerusalem, two cities. Uh, first, the, the, there is a big difference in the size, in square kilometer. The Jordanian city was 6.5, the Israeli 38.1. The Israeli city was much bigger. Um, population size, 60.5 uh, in uh, 1961 in the Jordanian city, 200,000 in the uh, Israeli capital in 65. Uh, now the budget, of course, the budget of the Israeli, uh, the Israeli city was much higher, but what is very interesting is the percentage of the, uh, the uh, for development, or how much uh, was invested for development. So uh, the, in the Jordanian, municipality, the total budget was in uh, millions, uh, millions Israeli pounds. Okay, I took the Israeli pound in order to have a, 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 the, the same base for calculation. Uh, the total budget was 3.6 million, for which 2.85 for development. In the Israeli city, the budget was 60, of which 15 was for uh, development. Um, expenses for per capita uh, in the uh, is, uh, Jordanian side was 100, uh, in the mid uh, 50s, an Israeli pound, um, one, uh, 108, in the Israeli side, 370. So we see um, a big gap between the size and the budget and development a budget uh, between the, the two cities. The percentage of taxes paid to the city hall, the national taxes paid to the city hall in order to help the city to develop, in the Jordanian uh, city it was 12%, in the Israeli city 50%. So uh, what, what, what we see is a, a huge difference between the two, also in, in population. In 67, the Jordanian city was uh, 70,000 people. Uh, the Israeli city, almost 200,000 people. Uh, so uh, the, uh, is, the Israeli city uh, was further developed, much more populated, uh, spread over much greater area, but the, uh, this, this, the, gro the uh, growth of the population in the Israeli side was moderate despite the government heavy investments in, in Jerusalem. So the relative uh, development and the population growth. Uh, Israeli Jerusalem main source of population growth were Jewish immigrants from abroad, whereas the Jordanian Jerusalem, the newcomers to the city were locals, 48 war refugees and Hebronites. 
uh, the uh, Jordan, uh, Jordanian Jerusalem has more young persons than its Israeli counterpart. In mid-64, Israeli Jerusalem social composition was as following. 50% were born in Israel or mandatory Palestine, 25% in Asian and African countries, and 25% in Europe, mostly in Eastern Europe. Search of the origins of those who were born in Israel or mandatory Palestine shows that 45% of them were originated in Asian and African countries against 38 in Europe. In other words, in early, early 50s immigrants changed the balance between Western and Arab Jews. And this is very, very significant uh, component of Jerusalem. The demographic shift will lead in the 70s to the fall of the labor, mo uh, labor movement. The labor-led Israeli government uh, put uh, in transit camp the big number of immigrants in, in, in the early 50s. About 10,000 people lived in such a camp in South Jerusalem in Talpiot, transit uh, camp. Later, Israel relocated them along the armistic line, discriminated and fully dependent on the ruling Ashkenazi establishment. The core neighborhoods in Jerusalem, such as, for instance, Rehavia or Nachlaot, were populated by pre-48 Jerusalemites affili affiliated to local and national institutions. So they, Jerusalem was composed by core West Jerusalem, Israeli Jerusalem, by core neighborhoods that were affiliated in a way or another to the uh, ruling establishment and the outside ring along the armistic line of those who were rejected and discriminated systematically by, by, the, by the regime. The data shows also that a long timeline, more and more Israeli Jerusalemites did not experience pre-48 war shared city life. And this is very, very crucial. V only a small minority remembered how Jerusalem was pre-48. And this will create a collective mind post-67. Most of the Jordanian Jerusalems lived in, 60, in the year 61 in the old city. 36,800 persons. Just 23,600 lived outside the old city. The 48 war followed by Jordanian annexation of the West Bank terminated the rule of the old clan and wealth-based elite. The Husseinis, Nashashibis, Khalidis, Encouraged by the Hashemite struggle against the Palestinian nationalist elite that opposed the annexation, middle and lower classes enjoyed social mobilization and the Jordanian regime encouraged, and, and, and encouragement. It helped its supporters to move from Hebron to Jerusalem. The prestige of business, businesses owned by those who came from Hebron was in 1950 was 36% and 40% in 67. In addition, 67% of the old city residents and 95% of Abu Tor came, came from Hebron. So Jerusalem's social and economic and commercial life uh, were changed by, by this immigration encouraged by the Jordanian by, uh, regime. Whereas Israel gradually moved government, government offices to its capital and invest, invested in its development, Jordan kept its Jerusalem underdeveloped and em, empowered by Amman, by among other means, moving its, uh, uh, its Jerusalem offices from Jerusalem to Amman. Consequently, educated Jerusalemites emigrated to the developing capital, Amman. So the Jerusalem lost its young, educated uh, generation. I would like just to mention that 
Whereas in Israel there was a university, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, there was no university uh, in, in uh, Jordanian Jerusalem, for instance. Uh, in 67, only 26,000 people were original Jerusalemites. Hebronites dominated the Waqf, Sharia courts, Bureau of, Bureau of Commerce, and the city council. Only one person, Anwar Nuseiba, out of eight Jerusalem district governors, was local elite member. So Anwar Nuseiba is an exceptional. In the Israeli city, however, the old elite excluded the newcomers from leading positions. It was the opposite side in, uh, it, to what happened in Jordanian Jerusalem. The Ashkenazi elite patronized the immigrants and they governed them through veteran and newcomer Arab Jewish collaborators. In both cities, most employees worked in private and public services. So in both cities, uh, the public sector dominated the, the job market and also the, was the main source of income. Tourism was dominated income source in the Jordanian city, employing over 50% of the workers across different uh, professions. To, uh, in uh, the number of tourists coming to Jordanian Jerusalem in 1966 six, uh, reached 600,000 tourists, um, mostly coming from, uh, from Arab countries. Only 175,000 out of 600 came from Western uh, countries. Uh, Kalandia Airport became an international terminal in 1966 serving about 100,000 passengers traveling to sh for show distance um, uh, between uh, uh, Jerusalem and uh, the neighboring countries. Jo West Jerusalem, okay, the airport of West Jerusalem was and still is Ben Gurion Airport near Tel Aviv. Um, about 10% of each city worked in construction. It should be, be noted that in any two years before 1967, here, Israel built in Jerusalem more houses than Jordan along entire 19 years rule in Jerusalem. Uh, Okay, I will cut it shorter, fine. Um, there was a, a, a income gap data per occupation shows that wide gap existed in unskilled low income professions such as a, a, a construction or low rank uh, offices. The gap between the two cities narrowed, however, as the employee was skillful, professional, or in management position, and, and this, is, this is common in, in, both, in both cities. So what I, what I see from the data is that there, is, there are elements that the two cities share and elements that are very, very uh, different. Uh, An Israeli, it's, it's very interesting, an Israeli, official Israeli survey of uh, nine, 994 shops outside the old city, and the survey was made in July 68. The survey found that 926 out of 994, uh, so 926 person owned them. There were no branches in East Jerusalem commercial life. This, uh, this is ve very uh, interesting. No, no big branches or big chains existed in 67 in, in, in Jerusalem. Mostly middle class members owned them, as shown in the owner's place of residence. They lived in the old city or 
uh, in the Wadi Joz or Bet very few in Bet Hanina, for instance, which is the uh, place where, or Shoafat, where the, let's say, the elite, social elite, or the economic elite uh, lives. So uh, it's a, a, the, the data te tells us much about the uh, so socioeconomic composition of uh, each city, immigration, emigration, um, the transfer of offices, go governmental offices outside Jerusalem, and the anger, what we see that the uh, Jerusalem elite, the mayor, city council were, were very angered and frustrated by the Jordanian government uh, position and acts taken uh, in, in Jerusalem. They lost their status. The, uh, the, the mindset of the local elite, Jordan, uh, the Palestinian or local elite that lived and, and led Jer uh, Jordanian Jerusalem is that they were beaten by the government, and the government is, is very hostile uh, to, to, to Jerusalem. They took the prestige from the city, and there were many tensions between the city council uh, and, the, and, and the government, whereas the Mohafes, the governor, tried to mediate uh, uh, between them. But the, finally, uh, the, the, this is... Uh, a conclusion that leads us the post-67 era. What happened after 67 is not a, a, an accident. The, uh, it was created along, uh, in 48 war and the Jordanian policy towards Jerusalem um, uh, between 49 and 67. That the, the uh, the Israeli rule over the takeover, the easy takeover on, uh, uh, on uh, and Jordan, the Jordanian city is rooted in what was there, or what was done and not done by the Jordanians uh, up to 67 war. Thank you. Um, that's, that's very good. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Klein. Uh, those numbers and actually uh, your assessment at the end is actually quite interesting. Um, and it's something for us to, to think about. I think we can come back to that once uh, Noor has spoken. So let me now introduce you to Ms. Noor Arafe, who is a Rhodes Scholar at the University of Oxford. She's currently doing her PhD. Pre she was previously a teaching assistant at Columbia University and a visiting lecturer at al Bad College. Nor has consulted for several international organizations and previously worked as a policy fellow at, of Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network, and as an associate researcher at the Palestine Economic Policy Research Institute. She's written numerous policy briefs and op eds on the Palestinian economy in Arabic, English, and French, as well as in The Guardian, Le Monde Diplomatique, and Al Jazeera, among other outlets. She's recently published an essay with the Institute for Palestine Studies uh, the, and the Jerusalem Quarterly entitled, How Strategic is the Strategic Sectorial Development Plan for Jerusalem? Um, she's also written an essay with the Australian, Austrian Journal of Development Studies entitled, Resistance Economy, a new buzzword. So today's talk that Nora will talk about, she's going to talk about what she's titled it is, Which Jerusalem? Israel's Little Known Master Plans and Their Impact on Palestinian Lives in Jerusalem. Um, uh, in 1995, Edward Said had warned that it was only by first projecting an idea of Jerusalem that Israel could then proceed to the changes on the ground, which would then correspond to the images and projections. So what is Israel's <laughs> idea of Jerusalem? What is Israel's vision of Jerusalem five years from now or 30 years from now? So her presentation will try to answer these questions by actually looking at um, three Israeli master plans uh, that convey Israel's colonial projection of Jerusalem and its plan to turn this image into reality. Let me not talk anymore, but let not take over. Thank you. Know? you. Um, thank you, Michelle, for facilitating. Th thank you, Victor, Jamalia, for inviting us. And thank you, our audience, for uh, being here. Um, so, so I will talk about Israeli master plans for the city. But let me just first take a step back and um, 
identify the framework within which we can understand uh, Israeli master plans. Because one of the main arguments or messages um, that I would like to give you in this presentation is that the different political, economic, legal, and demographic measures taken by Israel to fulfill its goal in Jerusalem, we'll talk about this, fall within its larger settler colonial project that aims at displacing the Palestinian population to expand uh, Israeli Jewish domination over uh, the city. So in my presentation, I will start by uh, talking a little bit about the settler colonial project and the different logics um, underpinning it. I will then present some Israeli master plans, which represent a very critical stage of uh, the settler colonial project. And then I'll examine, I'll talk about the life of Palestinians and the impact of Israeli policies on uh, Palestinians living in uh, Jerusalem. And if I have time, I will conclude by presenting some options that Palestinians are now thinking of regarding what to be done in the short and uh, medium uh, term. So first of all, the framework, the conceptual framework. So here I'm drawing on an emerging a critical literature that defines Israel's project as a settler colonial one, thus challenging the common depiction of the so-called conflict as an ethnic or religious one. So settler colonialism is defined, and I'm quoting here an author called Andy Clarno, it's defined as a form of colonization marked by ongoing efforts to displace the local population and expropriate their land in order to establish or expand a society dominated by settlers, end of quote. So because of its continuity through time, because it's a continuous project, settler colonialism is seen as, I'm quoting, a structure rather than an event, and this was I'm quoting here Patrick Wolf, who is a renowned uh, author uh, who uh, uh, talked about settler colonialism not only in Palestine, but in other parts of the world. In other words, settler colonialism is a continuous practice. The history, uh, its history does not stop. So the occupation and legal annexation of East Jerusalem in 1967 is just another phase of colonization. So just like Isam Nassar in the uh, previous presentation, he said that we're still living an ongoing Nakba. What happened in West Jerusalem is now being experienced by Palestinians in East Jerusalem. So this is what I mean when we say it's a structure. It's not just 67 occupation was, just, was not simply an event. Um, so, as a historical force, settler colonialism in Jerusalem, as in the rest of Palestine, has been underpinned by different logics that are highly interlinked. And here I'm drawing on a book by John Collins entitled Global Palestine, in which he identified the different logics and... Um, uh, I'll talk more about this. So the first one is the logic of elimination that Patrick Wolf uh, talked about. So the elimination of the indigenous society in order to replace it with a new settler society has been at the core of Israel's project in uh, Jerusalem. As Theodor Herzl wrote, I'm quoting, if I wish to substitute a new building for an old one, I must demolish before I construct, end of quote. So you have... Um, destruction followed by replacement. In Jerusalem, the elimination of uh, the indigenous presence has taken different forms. Not all of them are physical or happen by force as, as in 1948, and this is something Isam uh, talked about previously. To eliminate Palestinian society, Israel has also sought to assimilate or incorporate them into the polity as the others who should be under constant surveillance, thus ensuring Israel's domination over all aspects of Palestine. Palestinian life. However, the incorporation of Palestinians has been conditional on one important demographic principle, that Palestinians must be the minority to secure Jewish control over uh, the city. And this has been a guiding principle of Israeli policies at least since 1967. Now, to deal with the so-called demographic threat posed by Palestinians, Israel in 1967 designated them as 
permanent residence whose res residency card uh, may be revoked any time under the, uh, the pretext of breach of allegiance. Israel also imposed severe restrictions on family unification and enforced discriminatory urban and zoning policies which confined Palestinian building to only 13% of East Jerusalem while classifying one third of the land as open landscape areas where Palestinians are prohibited from uh, building. It is this logic of elimination that is behind the potential plan by Israeli authorities to excise Palestinian neighborhood situated east of the walls. So here the, um, the, the line in red represents the wall. So all neighborhoods east of it. So here you have Shafat refugee camp. Up in the north, you have Kufar Aqab. So there's a plan now to, um, to redraw the municipal boundaries so that these uh, neighborhoods, which are only lived by Palestinians, would not be part of uh, uh, Jerusalem under Israel's control um, to prevent Jerusalem from be becoming a minority Jewish city in 2045. The second logic is that of expansion and access uh, to land because Israel views its, um, its frontier or border as a moving structure. And this is very similar to a map that Professor uh, Dumper uh, uh, had uh, previously because in 1967, Israel redrew the municipal boundaries of Jerusalem, illegally annexed 70 square kilometer of West Bank territory, including East uh, Jerusalem and Israel did so while making sure to exclude the highly populated uh, Palestinian uh, neighborhoods. The establishment of illegal settlements in red uh, in Jerusalem has also facilitated territorial acquisition. For example, 35% of Palestinian of the land in East Jerusalem has been seized for Israeli settlements. The settlements have also reshaped the, the geographical landscape isolating East Jerusalem from the rest of the occupied uh, West Bank. The building of the wall in, um, in, in red is also another demographic measure mentioned uh, this morning that Israel took to enforce its de facto uh, political borders of, uh, of uh, Jerusalem. The third logic is the logic of denial. It's about denying that there were indigenous people on the land before the establishment of the State of Israel. So the creation of myths has been central to the Zionist project. Myth like a land without people for a people without land. Worse, some movements like the Temple Mount movement stand reality on its head by stating that one of its goals is to, I'm quoting, liberate the Temple Mount from Arab Islamic occupation, end of quote, thus transforming the colonizers into the colonized and indigenous. This logic of denial has also entailed the manipulation of history and archaeology as powerful political tools in the recreation of Jerusalem as a Jewish city. Israel also undertook a renaming process in East Jerusalem to rewrite history along the lines of Zionist dicta. For example, Mamilla or Ma'manullah Cemetery was renamed Independence Park. Talbiya neighborhood was renamed Komemiyut and, um, and so forth. The fourth logic is that of exceptionalism. So for example, there was a poll by Haaretz newspaper in 2018, according to which 56% of uh, Jewish Israelis believe that Jews are a chosen people, and, there, and three out of four right-wingers believe that Israel has a divine deed for its land and that the right to Israel stems from God. This belief in the exceptionalism of the state of Israel Israel, coupled with the dehumanization of Palestinians, has provided the ethical or legal justifications for the dispossession of uh, Palestinians and the institutionalized discrimination against them. Now, all these logics are grounded in Israel's vision of Jerusalem as a unified, undivided Jewish city. One of Israel's main goals has been the Judaization of Jerusalem, which entails um, 
ensuring and expanding Jewish economic, political, demographic, and territorial control over the city while further evicting and dispossessing Palestinians. Now, to advance its uh, settler colonial project and turn its vision of Jerusalem into reality, Israel has perfected a planning system that represents the highest stage of settler uh, colonialism. This system combines national, district, and detailed outline plans and is advanced by different stakeholders. The government at the heart of the planning system, but also some NGOs and um, Jewish and the private sector, which all aim to achieve the political goal of Judaizing uh, Jerusalem. Now, one of the plans I would like to focus on is the 2000 Master Plan, also called Jeru Jerusalem 2020, which is considered as the eternal master, master plan. So it was first published in August 2004, and it, it is the first comprehensive and detailed spatial plan for uh, both East and West Jerusalem since 1967. The plan, which views Jerusalem as one metropolitan urban uh, capital uh, unit, the capital of Israel, seeks to ensure a solid Jewish majority of in the city. And to achieve this goal, the plan uses urban planning as a geopolitical and strategic tool to conquer more land while constricting Palestinian urban development in line with the logic of expansion and elimination uh, I was just talking about. For instance, in the area of housing, while most of the increase in Israeli Jewish building will happen through expansion and the building of new settlements, more than, more than half of the addition of housing for Palestinians will happen through densification or vertical expansion, which means building within the existing urbanized areas, despite the presence of serious hurdles to any possibility of vertical expansion uh, of Palestinian buildings. Israeli Israeli Jews are thus allowed more territorial expansion and control than Palestinians. The plan also allocates only 2,300 dunams for Palestinian construction compared to 9,500 dunams for Israeli uh, Jews. Besides urban planning, the tourism sector and its promotion has also been um, at the heart of thousands of Israeli plans for uh, the city. For, for instance, the plan I just mentioned focuses on supporting international and urban tourism and on investing in tourism infrastructure. Now, the development of the tourism sector is not only used as, uh, as a tool to achieve economic growth and attract Jews. Uh, to the city. That's one of the goals. However, it's also used as a political tool to develop an exclusively Jewish narrative of Jerusalem, thus recreating it as a Jewish city. And this explains why Israel has very strict rules over who can serve as tour guides and the history that tourists are uh, told. Where am I? Um, so, besides the state, um, some Israeli NGOs and the private sector have also played an important role in advancing uh, this uh, project. For instance, Elad um, is a right-wing settler organization, has been growing, it has been growing in political influence and financial power, and has been playing a major role in the remaking of urban uh, space. So if you haven't heard of it, it's, the organization works on settling Jews in Palestinian neighborhood of Silwan, and it also runs tourist and archaeological sites uh, there. And through these um, tour, uh, tour, uh, tours, tourists are exposed to El Ad's um, selective narrative of history that um, uh, disregards Arab presence uh, for centuries there and thus fits in with recreating Jerusalem as a Jewish city with predominantly Jewish history and uh, heritage. It is with al -Ad that U.S. Ambassador to Israel David Friedman and Middle East envoy Jason Greenblatt broke open a couple of days ago a new tunnel running under the Silwan neighborhood 
neighborhood in East Jerusalem. Um, it was part of an excavation of a large underground archaeological uh, site that has been ongoing for the past uh, six years. So besides settler uh, organizations, uh, Israeli Jewish entrepreneurs have also been playing a key role in Jerusalem. For instance, uh, Kevin uh, Burmeister, an Australian technology innovator and real estate investor, he developed the Jerusalem uh, 5800 5, master plan, which provides a vision of Jerusalem until 2040 or 2050, and views Jerusalem as a global city and an important tourist, spiritual, and cultural uh, world hub. Um, and the plan works in line with the uh, state's political demographic goals and expansionist logic. For instance, one of its um, one of its uh, goals is to increase the Jewish population uh, share in Jerusalem through increased migration in the city. And the project manager is actually a former manager in a large uh, settler uh, organization. Another uh, well-known businessman who has been at the center of uh, Israel's projects um, in, uh, in, in Jerusalem is Rami Levy. So his latest project was the development of of Atarot uh, Mall in the north of Jerusalem. It's on the road between Ramallah, Qalandia, and uh, Beit Hanina. And while the project is presented as an attempt to achieve economic peace, because it's a mall where Palestinians can open businesses along with Israeli Jews, and they work together, so it's an attempt to achieve economic peace and cooperation and so-called coexistence between Palestinians and Israelis, in my opinion, the, 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 the whole project reflects more than um, economic peace attempts because it's also a way to entrench Israel's sovereignty in Atarot, where Israeli settlements were based in the past, while also taking advantage of, um, of tax incentives uh, there, since Atarot is considered a region of uh, national development priority. So very quickly, um, these plans to Judaize Jerusalem have gone hand in hand with plans for the development of East uh, Jerusalem. However, one of the arguments I'm making is that these plans mainly aim at pacifying Palestinians and integrating them into the Israeli system. So these plans that invest billions of dollars in social or employment development of the uh, of Palestinians living in East Jerusalem or they invest in the educational sector. Their stated objective is to bridge the gap between uh, the, the eastern and western parts of, uh, of uh, the city. However, one of the main reasons uh, behind the interest in economic development in Jerusalem is the belief that the improvement of socioeconomic conditions in, of Palestinians living in Jerusalem would increase Palestinian uh, sense of belonging to the state of Israel. So in other words, development plans for East Jerusalem are also used as a political tool to make sure that Palestinians are quiet and to subsume, to, uh, to subsume them into Israeli institutions, thus quelling Palestinian uh, resistance. Now, how about Palestinians um, living under Israel's regime in uh, Jerusalem? So I will briefly present the impact of Israeli policies at the political, institutional, economic, and uh, community levels. So the death of Faisal Husseini in 2001 and the closure of the Orient House by Israeli authorities represented one of the most adverse obstacles to Palestinian steadfastness in Jerusalem and exacerbated the void that was left uh, after Oslo and the deferral of Jerusalem to final uh, status negotiations. So since then, Palestinians in Jerusalem have been enduring a leadership and political vacuum that has left them with very limited political power. And despite the presence of over than seven official entities to represent Jerusalem, these entities are either completely inactive or play a very limited uh, role on uh, the ground. 
This political vacuum has been exacerbated by the institutional um, atomization in East Jerusalem. For instance, since 2001, Israeli authorities have closed at least 32 Palestinian institutions and NGOs in, um, in uh, Jerusalem. And for, in for example, the Jerusalem governorate and the Ministry of Jerusalem Affairs, they operate from a building in Aram, which is outside the Israeli-defined municipal boundaries of Jerusalem. So they really have very limited impact uh, on uh, the ground. And this reality has been exacerbated by the lack of a vision and plans to enhance uh, steadfastness and resistance in East uh, Jerusalem. While several plans have been developed for East Jerusalem since Oslo, they have mostly remained ink on paper due to, because there were basically the plans have no executive arms. So they are very nice on paper, but then they are never implemented on the ground. And as a result, Palestinians in East Jerusalem Jerusalem have been um, have lost confidence in uh, formal plans for the city, uh, thus increasing their disgruntlement with the Palestinian uh, Authority. So this political uh, situation has coincided with the economic deterioration of East Jerusalem. In 2016, 75% of Palestinians in Jerusalem and 81% of Palestinian children were living below the poverty line. Uh, socioeconomic conditions have also are also characterized by a stagnant investment environment, a very tough business and trade uh, environment, deindustrialization because many businesses are now moving to Ramallah, for example, or to uh, Jericho. There's loss of productive capacity of the economy. The tourism sector is very restricted, etc. And meanwhile, East Jerusalem's economy seems to be heading towards further integration into the Israeli economy. This is indicated by the over of Palestinians in Jerusalem on the Israeli labor market, uh, the dependency on the Israeli health and education, and the development of economic and commercial relations between the eastern and western part of uh, the city. We also have an identity a crisis in Jerusalem as a result of Israeli efforts to uh, control the educational curriculum and what Palestinians are taught. So these efforts uh, um, combined with the lack of a political leadership have uh, led to uh, an identity uh, crisis. I don't know if I have time to um, look at the future. Maybe we can discuss it in the... Yeah, the exactly. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let me say a few things before we, we open out to questions because I have some observations. It's been interesting to listen to both our speakers. Um, uh, you know, Professor Klein has actually talked about uh, Jerusalem, the divided Jerusalem pre-1967, um, and uh, what some of the statistics have actually shown. And that was quite, I thought that was quite interesting. Um, and uh, uh, what what Noha, Ms. Harafi has shown us is that uh, she has talked about, she's addressed the issue of the Israeli master plans. Um, I'm sure that there's, there many people have many questions or comments to make. Um, for me, when I listen to the two of you uh, and what you have presented, I go back to think about what Professor Damper spoke about this morning, which is really about the fluidity of the borders of the city and what they inherited in Jerusalem under the British mandate. Um, and I wonder what, how that has also played out in what has happened in the decades after. Okay, let me now open the floor to questions. When you ask your question, could you please identify yourself and indicate who you would like to speak with? Is uh, who you're addressing your question to? Is it to Professor Klein or is it to Ms. Arafe? Or both of us. Or to both, which is fine as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But you don't have to identify yourself because we all know who you okay, are. <laughs> yeah. Just to get the discussion going, um, uh, Menachem, I was really interested in those figures and um, they're, they're fascinating, the contrast. But I wonder if actually 
Um, well, the, the, uh, that, that contrast makes a really useful historical and political point. Do you think you also have to add to that contrast a comparison with West Jerusalem and other Israeli cities? Hmm. Because um, it, the way that it's contrasted, it looks like Jerusalem is shooting ahead, West Jerusalem is shooting ahead during that period, but actually in the Israeli context in that period, Jerusalem was actually declining and being impoverished. And it would be interesting to know, um, you know, uh, how relatively successful Jerusalem was in establishing itself during that period. Just a comment. And then in, in relation to that, um, what did the um, status of um, I can't, I, I'm not quite sure if I pronounce this correctly, the Amana, Amana status, but Hashemite ah. kingdom conferred on Jerusalem the state of Amana? Uh, Amana to the Quds. yeah. And uh, did that play any, you know, was that just a cosmetic exercise or did that have any substance to it uh, at all? Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, I have a question more out of curiosity, picking up uh, where, where Michael was going with the Amman uh, Um You were speaking about the conflicts that were happening between uh, local Jerusalemite officials in the municipal council and the Jordanian government. So I was just curious about the figure of Rohe al Khatib, who was the last uh, I mean, to be actually based in uh, in Jerusalem in '67, and then was expelled. So that was more um, out of curiosity. <laughs> oh, no, no, fair question. Um, okay, for Menachem, it's uh, what was the real uh, vision of the Jordanian regarding uh, Jerusalem? It's uh, it's not just about uh, comparing Amman and Jerusalem, but how did they uh, saw it? Uh, and uh, for you, Noor, um, you mentioned two aspects, uh, uh, criticism on uh, Israel uh, about the uh, economic uh, and the economy and the um, educational system, uh, which in Israel um, invest huge amount amount of uh, money in the uh, last few years so and you, you and you gave the criticism about uh, this and, and uh, you, you explained it uh, very well uh, but uh, uh, on the other side the um, um, I know that um, leaders from the uh, um, east part of the city uh, ask for Israel to upgrade the systems, uh, invest money, uh, specifically uh, regarding the uh, educational, uh, when asked to be part of the uh, Israeli uh, high school uh, Bogot exams and so on, uh, to get involved. So uh, how can you refer to it? Okay, so the, okay, so we start. start. Okay, okay. Uh, let's start. Uh, Mick, uh, actually, not having enough time, so I skipped. Thank you for asking. We did not coordinate. Uh, so, uh, although uh, capital Israeli Jerusalem enjoyed tranquility of provisional city before 67, at the end of a narrow road to the coastal plain. Uh, main security, political, economic, commercial, and printed presses centers were in Tel Aviv, of course. But what I compared is the Jordanian and the Israeli Jerusalem, uh, which tells a lot about, uh, 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 about what happened after 67, but you are right. Jerusalem was uh, like any other peripheral city, um, the, similar to, to Jordanian Jerusalem that the kingdom titled as its capital, a spiritual capital before 67 war, Israeli Jerusalem enjoyed higher symbolic status rather than actual status. 
But if you compare the two symbolic cities, Jerusalem uh, went, uh, was uh, more developed and, uh, th than the Jordanian one. Uh, regarding Ruhi El Khatib, which is uh, very interesting, Ruhi El Khatib, uh, the mayor and the Mohafiz, the governor, each of them knew that he is dependent on Amman. Amman can kick him out of office immediately. But they also were, in many cases, not all, but many cases, local Jerusalemites. So the city council members were very angry and frustrated and, and uh, expressed their frustration in uh, the city council meetings. And the Ruch El Khatib uh, uh, and the Mohafiz always tried to mediate between them and the Amman and the king. Yes, of course, you are right. I will try. I will. And he promised and so on. Uh, also, the king came very often, Hussein, very often to, to visit uh, the city, to pray uh, in the city. He started building a palace in Tel El Ful um, there before 67 and stopped. Uh, the war uh, ended the building. Uh, Jordan did not have any vision to Jerusalem, except Jerusalem should be uh, subversed and, and, and underdeveloped, de fully dependent on, on Amman. Remember that uh, King Abdullah I was murdered in Jerusalem while King Hussein stand next to him. It, it was a very formative negative traumatic formative experience for the young uh, for for the young hussein to be, to become a, a king so the, this this was the uh, the collective memorial but it it was the regimes only not the people the people most of them did not share uh, the jordanian official position in their mind they were palestinians um, from the interviews that i i managed all of them listened to every speech of Gamal Abdel Nasser. Every, he was very popular in East Jerusalem, the Arab leader, and so on. Many of them were, were members of Kaumiyun al-Arab, okay, and, and opposition uh, uh, parties and movements and so on. Although they did not revolt, but they, they were the opposition to, to, to the Jordanian regime and to the annexation centered in the West Bank, including Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was a very parochial city, holy city, parochial city. Uh, for instance, when I asked people uh, on their memoirs, Jerusalemites, they said they went to Ramallah to eat ice cream. There were only three cinemas in the city, but having good time, Ramallah or Jericho. Not in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a parochial religious city. Uh, regarding Amanat al Quds and the strategic cooperation with the um, uh, with Jordan, if I un understand, this was the the the, the, the question. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas acknowledges that uh, in order to preserve the Palestinian stance in Jerusalem, he needs a, a Jordan. And Jordan uh, uh, knows very well that in order to preserve Jordan's special status in Jerusalem, they need a Palestinian kosher st halal stamp, okay, I would say. Um, uh, uh, so they agreed to uh, uh, that uh, Jordan will be the custodian of the holy places, uh, uh, Arab holy places, Muslim and Christian in Jerusalem, mediate between the kingdom and the Israeli government. But and Jordan acknowledges the Palest uh, uh, Palestinian sovereignty over East Jerusalem once they achieve it. So this is the, uh, the deal uh, between them. Actually, the only power that can restrain Netanyahu's governments in Jerusalem is the uh, Hashemite kingdom. That, that's the only, only power that keeps Jer Netanyahu, let's say, frightened and restrained. The policy, the, the uh, main decisions on, in Jerusalem, on Jerusalem, on East Jerusalem, are made by Netanyahu 
and his office and assistant, nobody else. Neither the, the special cabinet on Jerusalem Affairs or the head of the Jerusalem police or the head of the Israeli security services in, in Jerusalem and so on. It's Netanyahu only. For instance, after the heavy pressure of uh, Abdallah and uh, John Kerry, Netanyahu stated something that even Moshe Dayan never said, that Jews will not pray on Temple Mount, only in West, uh, the Wailing Wall. Okay? Remember, I'll just to remind you, when six, in 67, Moshe Dayan uh, brought to the cabinet and the cabinet approved the decision, the following decision, the decision was made as following. Jews who want to pray on Temple Mount will be asked to go to the Wailing Wall. This was the, the now just to, to, to show you how politicians make decisions, even historical decisions, the wor this wording of the cabinet of 67 cabinet that Diane worded were not in the mind of Netanyahu. He came out publicly, also in the Knesset, saying Jews will not pray in, on Temple Mount, which no Israel, pre, previous Israeli decision maker stated. Having known, remember what Dayan said, he could copy it, but none of his assistants has historical memory. That's the way politicians work, unfortunately. Yes, that's it, and now it is a fact that was made by Netanyahu, he went much further than uh, the Israeli uh, great occupier Moshe Dayan uh, uh, at, 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 that, at, at that time. Now, finally, I, I would like to, 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 to ask you, I, I forgot saying that in my presentation, anyone who can help me with the uh, memoirs or materials regarding Jordanian Jerusalem, please write me or t tell me the sources. I will be very, very thankful because I, I need there are very, very few uh, primary sources uh, on uh, uh, the Jordanian, uh, Jordanian period. So I look forward to your help. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Hello. Yeah, uh, just to. Oops. Yeah. Um, so just to answer your question, I think my main issue and the main um, point I was making is not with the fact that Israel is investing, for example, in the educational sector, but it's about more the reason, uh, the vision uh, guiding these investments. For example, in the educational sector, um, one of the main conditions um, that Israel imposes on Palestinian schools that receive funds from the Israeli municipalities is to teach Israeli censored textbooks, not the Palestinian textbooks that Palestinian students in the rest of the West Bank, for example, are using. And there's in these textbooks, especially in the area of history, the um, the history of Palestine the, uh, is, is not really taught in a way just like other Palestinians are, um, are, um, are, are, are being taught. So there's this effort to eradicate political consciousness and political identity of uh, Palestinians in East Jerusalem behind these investments in the educational sector. I, I would like to add something to, you, to what, you, what you said in your presentation, if I may. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you spoke, and uh, I agree with you, on the Palestinian problem, on the, the, the Israeli occupation. But I would like to say that Israel faces a problem in Jerusalem. We, we, we cannot ignore that. The, all what you said is uh, Israel tries to struggle and overcome its problem. And the problem is first and foremost demographic. 40% of the of Jerusalem residents are non-Jews, no non-Israelis, and this is uh, uh, this goes against the Israeli policy since 67. 67, it was 25, 75. F few years later, less than 10 years, it was 70, 30. Israel since then struggled uh, till the. Uh, 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 21st century, Israel struggled to maintain the 70 30 uh, proportion, failed. Now it's 40 60. And this is the, this is the uh, a, a binational city 
And 40% of non-Jews, non-Israelis is a mixed city, divided city, whatever we call it. Now, even the Israeli investment in tourism, for instance, in uh, Silwan, uh, calling it City of David, not Silwan, opening a tunnel, what is behind it? Behind it is that there is a, a small uh, compounds of settl settlers inside Silwan, surrounded by about 12,000 Palestinians in Silwan and Ras Al Amud, okay? They cannot ignore it. They try to ignore it. Of course, in, in, the, the, in the discourse, they ignore it. But what, they, what do they do by tourism? They bring hundreds of thousands per, per year, or perhaps millions. I think it's over a million. It's the most visited tourist site in, in Israel, uh, the, uh, the city of David. Uh, they bring many, many Israelis, Jews, not only Israel, Jews, to visit the place, and then there is a Jewish presence without living in the city. Okay, they try to, to balance the Palestinian de facto neighborhood. So, and another strategy is to, to, to build an underground Jewish city, or to ex excavate and, and explore the Jewish city, the Herodian city, and bring the tourists down they, they, they disregard, they don't see the Palestinians. So th these are attempts to ignore the, uh, the demographic problem, which is also, but it creates another problem, the inter or the, in another aspect of the, of the Israeli problem, is with the in gr growing integration of Arab Jerusalemites, Palestinians from East Jerusalem in the Israeli economy. Now, it's a mutual de dependency. 40% of the uh, uh, labor force in West Jerusalem are, East, are Jerusalemites from East Jerusalem. The drivers, the, the chefs, the uh, buses cannot, if tomorrow uh, Israel withdraw overnight from East Jerusalem, there will not be buses in West Jerusalem. That's it. All the most of the bus drivers are East Jerusalemites. So it creates a dependency that Israel is locked in into its vision uh, and tries to struggle with, with, with the, the demography and, with, and reshape the conscience of the Palestinians. But, uh, but actually, they, they fail. As the Faisal Husseini once uh, was challenged by a journalist, Asking him, see, Israel makes facts on the ground everywhere. Faisal said, we are the facts on the ground. That's it. And so, but it's, it, it's an Israeli problem. Actually, it's an Israeli problem no less than it is a Palestinian problem. Thank you very much. I've got a, I think two questions for both of you. Um, might be a bit obscure, the first one. Um, but it's connected to this idea of borders, changing borders, demography, uh, what is Jerusalem? Um, about two years ago, just after Donald Trump recognized Jerusalem, there was a, an amendment made to the basic law on Jerusalem in the Knesset. Uh, about, it used to be you had to have two-thirds majority in the Knesset to, to change the the. Uh, uh, to change the boundaries, I think, of Jerusalem, and now it was reduced to a simple majority. So one of my questions is, what what was that about? Uh, why did they make that change uh, then? Are they trying? Uh, are they hoping to redraw the boundaries in the future, so perhaps uh, some of the Arab neighborhoods are no longer in included in Jerusalem? And my next uh, question is about these um, uh, organizations. Noor, you mentioned uh, that are rebuilding. Um, uh, you know the city of David and other places, uh, archaeological sites in in uh, in, in Jerusalem, um, master plans to try and make a Jewish city. So my my question is: To what extent do U.S. evangelical groups play in this? Is it just Jewish groups, or is there evangelical money coming in? And also the tourists. Is it Amelia? It's the most popular city of David is the most popular tourist site in Israel. Is it just Jew is it also U.S. evangelicals who are visiting these sites? Mm. Okay, I will. Uh, ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
don't, I don't wish to ask too many questions, but <laughs> if there aren't any, I've got quite a few. Um, it's to Noor. Um, uh, I completely agree with your analysis, and it's really good to see it summarized like that. Um, but what I've been wrestling with is that um, despite all this, and despite 50 years of occupation and planning, there is this Despite this um, 50 years of occupation and these kind of planning systems, there is evidence of a Palestinian pushback in lots of area, areas. And how does one explain that? You know, what's, what is Israel doing that's not working? I think some things are working. Um, you know, land is being lost and, you know, all the things that you talked about. But there's something not working. It's not been a successful colonization process to, to date, yeah? And why is that? And so I, what I've been thinking about, and I just want to test it with you, <laughs> see what you think. Um, I, I've got a sort of a, something I call the paradox of ethno-nationalist urban governance, which basically means that if there's an ethno-nationalist group that is dominating a city, it's creating conditions which are run counter to its aims. And this could have been happening in the Maronites in Beirut, um, you know, Serbians in Sarajevo, uh, um, Hindus in Varanasi, loyalists in, in, in Belfast. If you push one agenda that privileges one part of the community over and above the other part, that the subordinate community gets marginalized and looks for assistance outside of the state and other forms of, uh, of mobilization, funding, and such, mm -hmm. which means the state has less control over it because it's not part of the state. And then somehow, the more you push the ethno-nationalist governance, you know, uh, the more it's not going to work. And I just wonder if that's what's kind of happening in, in Jerusalem at the moment. It's the sort of theory I'm testing at the moment. So perhaps you want to answer Victor's questions first. I, I will. And then after that, we can answer Michael. Okay. So um, do you, you want to start first? Uh, sure. Uh, very quickly, um, yes, U.S. evangelical groups are actually playing a very, very uh, critical role uh, in uh, Jerusalem, not only by funding many of these settler organizations like al Ad or Ateret Kohanim. So Ateret Kohanim focuses on settlements in the old city of uh, Jerusalem, but has a very similar vision to, the, to that of al Ad. But um, they have a very big presence in terms of funding. Um, so they are behind the financial power of many of these organizations, and also in visiting. OK, thank you, Victor, also for the, uh, for the question, because it's a follow-up to what I said about demography. Uh, for many years, uh, I can say my personal experience, for many years when I spoke also to decision makers in media on the Israeli problem in Jerusalem, including uh, the, uh, the demographic burden, okay, that runs against the Israeli interest, I was attacked by right-wing uh, people. Recently, the right-wing um, senior cabinet members acknowledged, not all of them, some of them, including Zev Elkin, for instance, a very hawkish cabinet minister. They acknowledged that, yes, very... What happens in Jerusalem runs against our interest. They don't want to give up Jerusalem. So they came up with what I call the demographic engineering by changing the account base. If the account, current account base is the annex area, let's exclude parts of the annex area out of the account base, not out of the, uh, of the Israeli annexation. They will remain under Israeli annexation, but account the, uh, the, out of the account base, who is Jerusalemite? And then we'll in, include in the account base settlers on Greater Jerusalem, Envelope Jerusalem, Etzion Block, and outside. And then we will go back to the 70, 30, 40, uh, 60, uh, 40 for our, uh, uh, even 70, 30, even less. 
in favor of the Jews, and we will establish a, a special council for those who we, uh, 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 under Israeli law, under the annexation, for those who we exclude. So Kuferak, Ben Shafat, refugee camp, and so on, they will be, remain annexed, but not non-Jerusalemites. So it's a trick. Now this created a big debate inside the Israeli right wing, because there were all the, uh, the ultra-conservative right wing uh, members that said, oh, you are changing the borders of Jerusalem? They are sacred. You, can, you are not allowed to make it. A, it's, a, it's, a, a, it's a basic law. It's like a constitution, and it is stuck in, in, in the, the government. But what is the importance of this, uh, uh, of this development, this proposal, which did not materialize? Just the amendment of the basic law that is needed, 80 and 80 something uh, Knesset member supporting it out of 120. The importance is that in the, in the heart of the right wing, there is acknowledgement that Israel, Israeli annexation at the moment failed. They need to rescue the project. And they try to rescue the project. So the, uh, the David Friedman breaking the wall a few days ago in the new tunnel, the 4th July uh, reception by Friedman in Jerusalem for the first time uh, today, or it was yesterday night or today, uh, for the first time, and so on. The, and the government, uh, Bibi Netanyahu, very, very proud of it. It's all in order to rebuild the, the, the Jewish Jerusalem, the Israeli control over Jerusalem. And, and, and these are the different attempts to hold the Israeli control against the reality on the ground that it is not a Jewish city, exclusive Jewish city. The narrative is that the people are divided and, and so on. And they try, they try, but in my view, they will fail. Thank you. Um, does that answer your questions? Okay. Would you like? No. Would you like to answer Michael's? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, thank uh, Michael. Again. That's a very, very interesting question. I wish I had more mental power to think about it with only five, uh, four hours of sleep. But um, so, if I understood you correctly, uh, your main assumption is that colonization has not been successful in Jerusalem, and the main question is why? Because we still have. Um, as you mentioned, uh, the Palestinians. So, um, so, so yeah, it's, uh, I agree with it to the extent that now some Palestinians are actually seeking Israeli passports, Israeli citizenship, some Palestinians. So Palestinians in Jerusalem are only residents. So they have residency cards. They don't have the Israeli uh, citizenship. And some Palestinians now are seeking the Israeli citizenship as a way to ensure that they remain in Jerusalem. So for example, if I get married to a person from the West Bank, I make sure that I have the Israeli passport beforehand to make sure that you know I can um, my residency card will not be withdrawn. So this is, I think, another indication of uh, the failure. I, I wouldn't say failure, but it's an indication that Israel has not achieved its uh, goal of, um, of uh, colonization. Even I hear many stories about Kufar Aqab. There are now claims about Israeli plans to uh, have Kufar Aqab, where more than 150,000 Palestinians live, outside of the municipal boundaries. And there was a report by the ICG a couple of weeks ago that talks about one of these plans. And one of the main Palestinian responses was that, OK, we'll go back to Beit Hanina or to Shu'fat. So we are there. Um, why? I think I need more mental power to, <laughs> to, talk, to, to discuss it with you. Sorry. Okay, any other questions? Yes, <laughs> and then I will take that from you. Oh. Just a comment. What you described sounds like the Republicans gerrymandering and, uh, and, and the issue with the census. It sounds exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what, what the Republicans make, Jordan makes every election. 
rearranging the, the in order that the uh, East Eastern loyals to the king will win the seats in the parliament. In any Arab countries, it's uh, it's done. It's a practice, very well known practice. Yes. I just wanted to go back to your abstract. I think that's where you made uh, reference to Edward Said's piece on projecting mm. Jerusalem. Mm. And since you, ha you, I think you had wanted to talk about the Palestinian vision for Jerusalem, mm. and you didn't get to it. So I, I just am curious to hear about that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you um, for asking the question. Mm -hmm. So I wish I could talk about a Palestinian vision uh, for Jerusalem. I really wish because there's no vision. Um, uh, there's the sense, there's a big generation gap uh, in general in uh, in Palestine. And this gap with the political leadership is especially huge when it comes to Palestinians in Jerusalem who don't feel like they are represented by the Palestinian Authority or their aspirations. So there's the sense of abandonment uh, by uh, the Palestinian Authority and disgruntlement uh, with it. So the vision, so-called, for the Palestinian Authority is that East Jerusalem is the capital of the uh, state of, uh, of Palestine. But um, it's very clear that this is only, it's like, it's more of a discourse or rhetoric by the Palestinian Authority that is a very, um, that, does, that is not in line with the actions on the ground. For example, in 2015, in the budget of the Palestinian Authority, less than 1% less than 1% of the PA's budget was allocated to, uh, to Jerusalem or to plans in Jerusalem. So this is just gives you an indication about what the, the PA is, uh, is doing. So since Oslo, many plans have been developed for uh, Jerusalem. Recently, uh, a couple of months ago, the, uh, the Palestinian Authority published another uh, strategic sectorial development plan uh, for East Jerusalem for the next five years. In, on the same day, another plan, Palestinian plan, was published and was launched by the negotiation support unit with different, you know, the same goal. Um, they talk about the same sectors, but it's just, it's, it's representative of the lack of unity and the fact that we just have these paper, these plans that remain ink on paper and that lack any executive arm to be, um, to be uh, implemented. So this has led Palestinians in Jerusalem Jerusalem to try to figure out what can be done, especially now with the Trump administration and the lack of, uh, of any support. There, e there isn't even a vision among Palestinians in Jerusalem, but one of the, um, one of the uh, uh, options uh, is to develop a, um, uh, or to establish local committees in East Jerusalem uh, neighborhoods as a way to, um, for example, uh, reach out to the Israeli municipality or to the Palestinian uh, Authority and demand uh, some rights. There are other options that can be problematic or seem problematic to others, like asking the joint list of the Arab-Israeli parties in the Knesset to represent East uh, Jerusalem. Uh, there's also another option regarding the pressuring the Palestine Liberation Organization or the Palestinian Authority to, you know, take the lead in, uh, in representing Jerusalem. With the municipal um, uh, elections um, recently, some Jerusalemites, they wanted to be, uh, to be uh, part of the elections, but at the end it was a failure and many of them dropped. But this just, it, I think it shows that Jerusalem is really in a limbo and Palestinians in Jerusalem are in, uh, are in limbo. Mm. Uh, but I don't think everyone understands how important the rent house, what, what, what it functions in the depth of phase of the same. Mm. The fact that you still have you know, laptops and the jackets of the guys who are working in Orient House, and then it was closed down and it's still there. So that's one of the explanations for why they can't implement any of these plans. Exactly. So the Orient House, it was the basically the seat of the Palestine Liberation Organization in, uh, in East Jerusalem. And Faisal Husseini is a very... Um, is a very well-known political leader who was really 
on the front when it came to Jerusalem and resistance against the Israeli occupation. And since his death and the closure of the, uh, of the Orient House and other institutions, for example, the Chamber of Commerce cannot, is working from, um, is not working from Jerusalem and they have very limited underground. So Israeli merchants are individually reaching out to the Israeli municipality and they don't really take seriously the, the Palestinian, the Jerusalem Chamber of Commerce. So all this um, uh, institutional vacuum also explains the lack of uh, the lack of a vision, especially because there's a big controversy between some Palestinians uh, who actually just want to be part of the municipal, to participate in the municipal elections and just accept the reality on the ground and Israel's sovereignty, and others who are just against it for moral and uh, moral uh, reasons. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I would like just to add something. The, vac the leadership vacuum, which I fully agree, uh, of course, uh, uh, started with the closure, the death uh, of Faisal and the closure of the Orient House, but the leadership vacuum creates a problem for Israel. What's the problem? There is no leader. There is no leadership in East Jerusalem. If there is a crisis, there is, there is no address. To whom pick up a, a, a phone? To whom uh, 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 cut a deal regarding, I will give you this call for, for, uh, for a restraint and quiet. So the only way that the Israeli authorities, the Israeli security forces can manage um, uh, the, the conflict in Jerusalem is by massive arrests. Every night they arrest or impose force, let's say last week in Isawiya, just to teach them the lesson who is the boss, mm. and so on. Arrest many young people that may perhaps they wrote something in the in the uh, 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 in the website, in Facebook, etc., in order to f to calm down the boiling pot. That's the only only way. It comes with a price. So no leadership. There is no. Uh, there is a vacuum of leadership. The Palestinian Authority is excluded from Jerusalem. There is no address. There is no address. You cannot deal with with somebody that is acceptable for for the public and the young generation and so on. So the the, the chaos cost a lot. I don't know how long Israel can continue what the security service call uh, mowing the lawns. Cutting the grass when 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 it is uh, uh, very fresh and 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 small. That's the policy at the moment. It's from tonight to night to night to night without a strategy. Okay, this is the last question. Um, because we are I'm running out of time. In fact, I, I think I, I'm getting bail film looks from the back, so clearly we've run out of time. But I'm going to take this last question. Uh, just, yeah, just a for quick home. one. Um, Michael Peng from the... Uh, I work at the British High Commission uh, for the Department for International Trade, mm. but I'm here mainly on my uh, out of personal interest. Uh, question to uh, Ms. Uh, Arate, but also to uh, uh, Professor Klein. Um, it seems quite uh, bleak, you know, what, what, what you've been saying so far, but the question has been asked before. I'd like to pose the same question to you about what do you see is, um, do you see any light at the end of the tunnel? Professor Dumper has suggested five years, no, no change, but um, uh, how do you see this panning out and what are your hopes for uh, resolutions to this conflict? So I okay. Uh, okay. I'm always very happy to take. The, uh, in the late 90s, uh, I was among the very few Israelis that supported uh, dividing Jerusalem and uh, transferring the East Jerusalem to uh, to the Palestinian full Palestinian state. I was isolated. Very very few supported that. To uh, Today, I'm also isolated because the consensus, the new consensus, even in Palestine, over 50%, is there is no hope for two-state solution. So I still think that two-state solution is the less problematic. It's not ideal, not, not a, a, a new Middle East. The less problematic solution, and it's achievable if the, si if our, the conditions are right, and so on. Um, I think that any other option is much more problematic. 
So a uh, uh, two-state solution with East Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Palestine and full Palestinian sovereignty over Temple Mount, to, to be clear. Uh, so uh, uh, I think this is the light in the end of, of the tunnel. However, politicians reach the right conclusion after, uh, after, only after trying and failing any other possibility. That's the situation at the moment. So the Israelis, I said, they, there is a problem. Israel, Israel, Israeli uh, government faced the problem, and they try, they try, they try, till they fail. And when they they will acknowledge their failure, then they will uh, they will come to the right conclusion. But but at, unlike what happened in uh, Oslo period, the Jerusalem was postponed to the end game. To, I think that we must start with Jerusalem. For many reasons, we can have a different discussion about it. We must start with Jerusalem, not start with settlement security, etc. May, we may, may start with settlements and security, but we should not postpone Jerusalem to the, uh, to the end game with, with the refugees. Regarding refugees, we must start with the Israeli-Palestinian refugees. We have more than 300,000 Israeli-Palestinian refugees that we deny, I say we Israelis, the Israeli government, we deny their rights, properties, and so on. They are not, uh, uh, they are not a demographic threat of right of return. They are already Israeli citizens, so we can start, but there is no one shekel allocated to compensate them when the Israeli, uh, Israeli argument is that no Palestinian will return and compensation is an exchange of actual return. There is no one shekel allocated to the Israeli-Palestinian refugees. So we, we, we can't start to settle the refugees with those who are our citizens, and, and the, if we come to terms with the Palestinians, we must start with changing the reality on Jerusalem. Thank you. Let me let have no have yeah. say something uh, about this. Thank you for uh, your question. We should have maybe started with this and spent uh, <laughs> one and a half hour discussing this. Um, the light at the end of the tunnel. I don't want to end on a pessimistic note, but I honestly don't think the future is very bright um, ahead of us if we remain, um, w if we continue working within the same political uh, framework, uh, especially the Oslo framework and the so-called peace process, because the peace process has so far not, has, has not really been about peace, it has more been about the process of Israel buying more time to entrench its control over land and its uh, settler uh, colonial uh, projects. So unless we actually um, break free of this colonial, of this uh, political uh, framework and reimagine a different framework within which we can actually agree on a solution with Israel, um, I don't think it would be um, um, impossible. Um, the light is that Palestinians are still resisting, that polit the political consciousness of Palestinians is stronger, um, is, is as strong as it was 50 uh, years ago. And there are now, there's a future generation, I believe, of young Palestinians who, are, who want things uh, to change on the ground. So it's just about the Palestinian political leadership currently, which is seen as uh, representing a big uh, obstacle um, in front of them. Um, at the same time, the Israeli society is heading, is shifting towards more extreme right wing. So this is not um, a very uh, um, <laughs> positive thing, but uh, I, again, I'll go back to the political framework within which um, we see the, 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 the so-called uh, conflict. And that's why I think it's very important to really um, define in details what is happening on the ground. I don't think it's, um, it's a religious conflict between Muslims, Christians versus Jews. It's not an ethnic conflict in my opinion. It's a colonial project. So it's only when we attempt or we decide to decolonize, whether this is within the two-state framework or the one-state solution, then we'll just be wasting more and more time, in my opinion. Thank you. Please join me in thanking both Noor and Menachem. Uh,